the name of God. Amen. Let's have a, a sweet sermon for you, Tiffany, shall we? Raise your hands, please, if, <coughs> if you at any time in the last month got outside early in the gray moments before dawn. And if you did, did you, do you, see that single bright star shining as clear and bright as a miniature sun? It was there this morning. Brightest and best of the suns of the morning. And uh, several parishioners live in my neighborhood. And from my backyard, that star was sitting right over Lee Blankenship's house. <laughs> Providence had placed a star, and I were walking toward the star, I would probably stumble into whatever Providence had placed there for me to notice. If Providence had said, touch that Christmas wreath and put a star over with nothing in between us, I wouldn't walk and I would stumble right into that Christmas wreath, wouldn't I? Now, I first saw this star this year, of all the good weeks in the year, during Christmas week. It was shining so bright in my window that it was casting shadows on my bed. Now until the most itsy-bitsy, teeny-weeny sliver of time in the vast record of uh, human history, people did assume that the sky events reflected events on Earth. A comet, or the darkening, even the momentary darkening of the sun, meant something very evil was in the making. The appearance of a new star generally would mean something good, or was, was happening, or about to happen. You all remember, I know it, I know you do, the Song of Deborah, the Old Testament judge and prophet. Her war victory song included that the very stars in their courses fought against our enemy. I know myself, trust that the stars and the planets interfere in human affairs for good or for ill. The song, of course, means only to convey the stars fought against him in their courses. That poor sap. Clearly he did not have a chance. <laughs> the universe does seem bigger than the stars should fight in our human wars. Indeed, the cosmos feels beyond the capacity of human beings to measure. It does seem boundaryless, doesn't it? So high you can't get over it. So low you can't get under it. So wide you cannot get around it. And yet, all through history, our different races of people have studied the matter of the stars and the planets practically forever. Believing that stars influence or even that they only signify our earthly events you may know some modern people who still study the stars, hoping to foresee events as they seem to do. Now, if this seems like magic to us, it seems so to the ancients, too. Men who drew sky maps and made tables of appearances. In our own day, of course, these are scientists. But in their day, these watchers of the sky were magi. That is to say, they were associated with magic and magicians. <clears throat> when they were not being associated with witches and sorcerers. Here are a couple of, line, of lines from the little opera Amal and the Night Visitors. The child we seek doesn't need our gold. His pierced hand will hold no scepter. His haloed head will wear no crown. The keys of his kingdom belong to the poor. Now, our gospel portion just now said of Herod, who called himself king of the Jews, right? It said that he and all of Jerusalem were troubled when they heard the three men state their errand. And as usual, the king's fear becomes the people's fear. You know, it is characteristic of an autocrat, of a tyrant, to feel the challenge, to feel the throne under him shake whenever signs of arrival appear. Mr. Churchill said, didn't he, that the dictators of Europe, Hitler, Mussolini, that they knew they were riding upon a tiger whom they dared not dismount. You will remember that it was one of our own Episcopalians, a 
vestryman named Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who said that all we had to fear was fear itself. By the way, Bishop Shipsky once told us that for that statement, my father refused to lead my family in prayer for him or his presidency. <laughs> Nothing to fear but fear. The late president, I think, was only half right. The true terror lies with those who use fear to keep people artificially frightened to death, just as we've been now for quite a while. Jesus, who has much to say about many things, never spoke of politics, but he did say, as he took his leave of us, I am going to the Father, but I am sending you a comforter, a strengthener, the Holy Spirit, who will lead you into all truth. Do not fear to go on. Apparently without fear, the wise men packed up and they set out. Now what was going on in their heads and in their astro prophecies about this child? The child, it says, in whom the Gentiles, that is, the other nations, the child in whom the Gentiles would hope. What were they thinking? Surely in the east, in their faraway homes, far beyond Palestine, far away from the sea, crossing this, the largest continuing strand of sand in the world, the great Arabian desert. The star in effect led them to Bethlehem and to the place where the child was. The Lord God Almighty might as well have put a neon pointer up saying, this is my body. Here, in this manger, Beginning in this moment, the three Magi had not known. How could they? They had not known. They had not heard that Yahweh Elohim is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. The only Bible they ever read was the night sky, the stars, and the planets in their courses. But what they found, as wise men do, was that those who watch patiently, many and many a night, those who wait upon the Lord find their strength renewed. They run without growing weary. They, they, they walk 800 miles from Persia in the year four <laughs> to brave the wrath of Herod. Probably also to brave the parting jeers of their own Persian or Arabian people. And, and to faint not from walking 20 and more miles every day, laden down as they were. Here's the opera again. How far, how far, my crystal star? Frozen the incense in our hands, heavy the gold. How far, how far, my crystal star? Called as they were. Well, they were called out of ignorance into awareness, out of error into truth. God called them out, not to adopt the belief system, though you might eventually adopt specific beliefs about him. God called them not to a special way of life, though you should get that. Not to church, though here we are. Not even called to read the Bible, though see the central place we give this. Said she, knocking it into the point seven. <laughs> no, it's not about belief systems. It's not about ways of life, not about church, not about Bibles. It is all about the person, Jesus. Baby Jesus. Jesus the man and son of man. You know that as for prophecies, they will cease. As for tongues, they will cease. For knowledge will come to nothing. Whenever we prophesy, we only do so in part. Our knowledge is only partial. Only when the complete has come to us will the incomplete pass away. Then we will see God fully, just as we are fully known by God. The wise men were then, as wise men are now, granted their wish, you might say. God, our Heavenly Father, gave them a spirit to discern the most needful thing, called them simply to see and to know the Christ, to love Him, to worship Him and Him alone. These magi seemed to have discerned something of who Jesus was without knowing exactly who he is. Yet it says, even so, they fell down and worshipped him. 
I think that in spite of all we know and all we hope to learn, to have discerned who Jesus is, even without fully understanding him, that is about as good as it's going to get for you and for me. The wise men, when they discerned him in the cradle, were overcome with an unutterable joy. They then saw themselves as they looked in God's sight. They found they could easily hand their riches over to him. If we worship the Lord and the beauty of holiness, we will grow into the proper posture of humility and humanity. We will become like Jesus. Can anyone doubt him? Just like if we worship political parties, flags, and emperor's standards, we'll become selfish and partisan and militaristic. If we worship money, we will become banks and cash boxes like old Scrooge and Marley. If we worship superficial personalities, all of our talk will become awfully superficial. If we worship safety and security, our lives like our homes will become fortresses of solitude. I believe, meaning simply, I trust. I trust that if we worship him, if we make him truly the center, so that we remember every moment in our lives as being lived in his presence and in his love. If we exchange these hearts, wherever they are stony, for more porous hearts, hearts more transparent to him, then we will, we will become like him. And one day, we will have the unutterable gladness of knowing God as God is. We'll pray to you not as we believe you to be, but as you know yourself to be. Where is Jesus, who is called Christ? Where is he that has been born? Christ. We have come to worship him. I was glad when they said to me, let us go and worship him. Let us go and see this thing. I, Jesus, have sent my angel. These are the last words in the last book of the whole Bible. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things to the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price.